Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to begin with three admissions. First admission. Rethinking worship is not about the purpose of worship. That is clear. The purpose of worship is to praise and worship and, and God because of who he is and what he has done. Rethinking worship is not about worship styles. And some of you may be breathing a sigh of relief. And some of you may be saying, hmm. Rethinking worship, I am not happy with the title. I just couldn't come up with another one I like better. We're going to be talking about rethinking an overlooked and ignored aspect of worship that has taken place in the church. And it's taken place in the Adventist church and it's taken place in most evangelical churches. Why have I chosen this topic? Probably within the last two years, this topic has resurfaced in my mind, and it's kind of been fomenting there. And it kind of came to a head. Uh, when I was on vacation uh, celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary in London a couple weeks ago. And on Sunday evening, we went to Westminster Abbey for an even song. And the music was gorgeous, and it was wonderful. And there was a part of that worship service at the beginning that when it was read, I, I just knew I had to cover this topic and study it more. And I talked to God about whether or not I should present it. So I want you to listen very thoughtfully. Listen and be aware of your thoughts and feelings as I read a prayer that was read at that even song, and even if it's a red prayer, it is still a prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have all offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no help in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent. According to your promises, declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now that's part of a liturgy. And most Adventist churches have what is called a free form of worship. And the idea and the thought behind that is we need to be spontaneous. And there, is, there are good things about that. We are responding to what God has done. And sometimes we look down on churches that have a liturgy as if, well, they're just saying the words. That is not necessarily so. You can have free-form worship and just be here and just go through the process, right? But there are some beautiful prayers that are said in liturgical churches. And this was one of them. And in case you missed it, the missing aspect, I believe, that we have in our worship service is the aspect of a communal confession or corporate confession in our service. Let me be very clear. I'm not talking about someone standing up in person, publicly stating, hi, my name is Gary, and let me tell you about my sins. I'm not talking about that. I'm not even talking about people in worship, making sure that they confess to one another. I'm not talking about that this morning. What I do want to talk about, I want to address the appropriateness and the potential benefit 
from having as a regular part, maybe not every week, but a regular part of worship, a time when we acknowledge and confess that we are sinners in need of grace. Some, some of you may say, but Pastor Gary, isn't confession a personal thing? Well, of course it is. But it's more than that. What's interesting is in the last 20 years or so, in Adventist churches and in evangelical churches, there's been a trend that we just want to have positive messages. We just want to come to church to get a blessing, and when we leave, we want to feel uplifted, and we want to feel good, and we, we just want this positive experience. And so we don't, haven't really talked about things like sin and repentance and confession much. And so you may ask the question, why talk about confession as part of worship? What's interesting is, as I was preparing this, I decided to look in Ministry Magazine. It's an Adventist uh, periodical. Every month it goes to all the Adventist pastors, and every other month it also goes to some pastors from other denominations who've been signed up for it or sign up for it. I went to their archives, and I plugged in Confession and Worship. And I was so dismayed because there was not one single article since the 1940s. Not one. And so I went and Googled Confession and Worship. And I found a site called the Gospel Coalition, TGC. It happens to be a coalition of Baptist churches. But they were talking about confession and worship and how we need to return to that. And there's a quote I want to read to you from it. It said, let's face it. Publicly voicing sins can be awkward. Prayers of praise fire people up, but prayers of lament and confession are more likely to bum them out. Why include something in our weekly worship that's going to inevitably dredge up painful memories of days past, of, of uncomfortable truths about ourselves? And, and there was another quote I found that said, by neglecting corporate confession, we unintentionally overlook a fundamental aspect of our worship that holds transformative power for both individuals and the worship community as a whole. So why have time for confession and worship? There is a biblical basis for confession and worship. Remember what happened to the children of Israel. When they were in the wilderness, there, there was a, a temple, a tabernacle that was built, and there were sacrifices that were made. And every morning and every evening when the sacrifice took place, what would they do? They would confess their sins and the lamb would be slain, right? always looking forward to Jesus as the true Lamb of God. And that happened on Sabbath as well. And if they had done something particularly egregious, they would have to bring their own sacrifice. But, but in the worship in the tabernacle, confession was made on a daily basis in worship. But that's not all. In the Psalms... The psalms were the hymn book of the Old Testament. They sang these songs. And the psalm that was read this morning would be a psalm that would be included in worship when David wrote about his confession of his sin with Bathsheba and he said, Create in me, O clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Against you and you only have I sinned. At the dedication of the temple, if you haven't read it in a while, 2 Chronicles chapter 6 Samuel rehearses God's dealings with his people and he confesses the sins of God's people in an, in, during a worship service. In Nehemiah chapter 9, the children of Israel had, had sinned against God and against the, the advice of Nehemiah and they started, the men started marrying women from, from other nations and those women were bringing in idolatry again and Nehemiah saying, wait, we've done this before. We went into exile in Babylon because of our, our idolatry. Let's not bring this in again. And he called the people together for a worship service. And in that worship service, they stood for a quarter of the day. Now, I don't know if that's a quarter of a 24-hour period or a quarter of a day daylight. It doesn't matter. That's a long time. They stood and they listened to the reading of God's word for one quarter of the day. 
If I asked you to read God, stand and while I read God's word for a quarter of our waking hours, I wonder how many people would be left. That's not all. They prayed and confessed their sin for a quarter of the day in worship. Standing. How long would you and I last today? doesn't stop there. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, and we'll read that passage later. But in Hebrews 10, talking about how we need cleansing from God, it also talks about the fact that, that they confessed, obviously, if they're going to receive cleansing from God. And it's in the context of a worship service, because at the end of that passage, it says, do not neglect meeting together. And then, of course, there are the prayers of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Have you read that prayer? I mean, Daniel was a, was a man who, there, there is nothing, nothing negative said about Daniel at all. I, I am sure he sinned, but, but in terms of Bible characters, Daniel is up here in terms of, of, of his behavior and, and conduct, right? And in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prays, and he confesses the sins of the people, and he confesses his own sins. Now, you can say, well, that was a private thing. Well, of course it was. But it's an example of the importance of confession. And then there was Nehemiah, De Nehemiah chapter 1. And again, it's, it's more private. But he rehearses the, the history of God's people. And he talks about how they'd erred and how they'd gone away. And he asked for forgiveness for God's people. A corporate prayer of confession and for his own sins and the sins of his family. And so there is biblical basis for confession in worship. But confession in worship also reminds us of both the holiness of God and of the sinfulness of humanity. Confession is basically agreeing with God. It's agreeing with God that that which he requires of us, of us and that which he commands from us are things that are good and holy and beneficial to us. It's agreeing with him that his ways are the best ways. And when we confess our sins, we are agreeing that when we did those wrong things, whatever it was, when I lied or when I stretched the truth, I was going against God's ways. I'm agreeing with him. And that's what confession is all about. I would remind you of, of two texts. One in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah was given his call. He had a vision of, of the things in the temple and how the angels were saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then, in Revelation 4, it talks about the angels in heaven singing before the throne, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, night and day, constantly. If our worship does not take place with the awareness of God's holiness, we've missed out on something very important, haven't we? I, I want you to think about that. You see, when we worship, there should be a simultaneous awareness of God's holiness and our sinfulness. In fact, when we do not include some aspect of confession in our corporate worship together, I believe we minimize both the holiness of God and our sinfulness. Because we don't have to think about it. Neglecting confession in worship takes away from our own individual confession. And I'm not naive enough to think that just because you were here and you heard a confession in worship, that that's automatically going to solve all, all your problems personally or all our problems as a church. But I think it gives us the opportunity, the opportunity to recognize the holiness of God and to recognize our own sinfulness I, I would like to remind you of a very, very much loved quote in Steps to Christ, page 64. 
the closer you come to Jesus, the more sinful, more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clear and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. I can hear somebody say, Pastor Gary, we live in a time of grace. We don't have to worry about this sin stuff. It's taken care of. As long as we are on this earth, there's a selfish nature within that clamors to come out. And I don't know about you, but my selfish nature comes out all too quickly and all too often. Confession and worship reminds us that I am no better than you and you are no better than me. It reminds us of what Paul said in, in Corinthians. There, I think it's Corinthians, there but by the grace of God go I. B by having confession on a regular basis as part of worship, it reminds us and helps us not to try and figure out I'm better than you because I do or don't do certain things but it reminds us that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. It reminds us that we're all sinners who, whose characters are imperfect and who, who, because of the grace of God, have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us so that the Holy Spirit can transform and change us according to His will and according to His ways. I believe when we have, on a regular basis, confession and worship, that our worship can become more authentic can become more authentic because if we never take time for confession if we never take time for confession we give in to our selfishness and pride it has been said that there are more masks worn in church than at any other time that should have got one smile from somebody's face do you catch the, what it's saying there are more masks worn in church than at any other time. Why is that? Because we, we want people to think that we've arrived and that we're good Christians and that, that, that we're doing better and that we've left our sins behind us. And that's not always the case. I think when there's confession and worship, it's easier to admit our ongoing struggle with sin. In the Adventist church, there has been a, a thread in the Adventist church, unfortunately, of towards perfectionism. I've got to become absolutely perfect. And those who believe in perfectionism, I, I believe there's a curse attached to it. Because one of three thing, or four things will happen. If you believe in perfectionism, that you must become absolutely perfect, you, will, you have to basically either deny that you're a sinner I've had people tell me they're perfect. And then later I, on, I found out they had some very, very serious sin issues. They were trying to cover up. Or you get to the point where you're saying, I'm not perfect, I'm supposed to be, I might as well give it up. I've seen people who've done that. Or you start doing the thing of pointing out the sin in others and ignoring your own sin. Or you come to the place of saying, God, I need your mercy and I need your grace. And that's the only one that has hope. That perfectionistic trend is seen in one of the hymns in our hymn, maybe more than one, but in one particular hymn I'm thinking of in our hymn, though. It's, it's hymn number 73. It's the one that starts out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Remember that hymn? In one of the verses, it says, uh, though the eye of, the original version of that song says, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Unfortunately, in our hymnal, they took out the word sinful because they thought that it would be saying that we're no longer, we're still sinful and we still are in trouble and that's not right. But by leaving the word sinful out, we're denying that what is what God says about us, right? I can't sing that song without leaving, putting that word in. 
though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. We are not going to see his glory until we get to, to heaven, right? Confession in worship reminds us of our continued need of grace. We are all on a journey towards heaven. We are all on a journey to becoming more and more like Jesus. We are all on a journey to become that which God created us to be in the first place. We are all on a journey, and we all grow at different rates, oh, and we all have different sins to overcome, and we all have different flaws in our characters, and we all fail far more than we'd like to admit. And I believe when we have confession and worship, it reminds us of that. And it makes and drives us to rely on the mercy of God and to rely on the grace of God. Confession and worship reminds us of the holiness of... I'm sorry. Confession and worship enables us to encourage one another in our struggle with sin. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. I've referred to it already. Notice the first part on, the, on this first slide talks about the fact of forgiveness, which must be preceded by confession, right? Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Next slide. Let us hold on swervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And notice verses 24 and 25, because it puts those phrases about cleansing in perspective of worship. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. How do we encourage one another? We pray for one another. How do we encourage one another? We are willing to be forbearing with one another, not to dwell on others' faults, but to dwell on what God can do in and through them. Confessions and worship helps us to remember that we are all broken people on a journey with God. Confession and worship enables us to make deeper confession to God, I believe, because we have a, a frequent reminder of our sinfulness and His holiness. Confession and worship enables us to more readily confess to others because we've already confessed to the one whose heart we have broken. I'm reminded of another quote from Ellen White from Steps to Christ. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken, and rejected by God. That is the good news of grace. Amen? I'm, again, not naive. I don't think simply adding a segment to worship where we have confession is going to make wow take place. But I am convinced that it will add a dimension to our life together as a church and to our individual lives that will not take place if we do not do it. I recognize I am only an interim pastor here. And it will be up to elders, board, whomever, to whether or not they want to include this on a regular basis. I hope at the very least we include on a weekly basis in our prayer for the congregation a confession of our sin an admission of God's holiness and an admission of our need of grace. 
there can be a variety of ways that confession can be added into worship, including such things as a moment of silence when you can individually do that. I don't know if you've had a blessing today, if you've been uplifted, or if you felt I've just been too negative. I, I refuse to apologize. Confession and worship has a biblical basis. Confession and worship has spiritual benefits. Confession and worship draws us closer to Christ in spite of our failures. And confession and worship can bring a unity and a bond that unites us instead of dividing us. We change the order of service. I've asked Victor, in light of the message of today, to give the congregational prayer and benediction, and then please stay by for the closing song. So Victor, come forward and lead us before God's throne of grace.